Mineral Surveyor and a long-standing member of the Institute of Quarrying. Over the 25 years of experience in surface coal mining, quarrying, waste management and brownfield remediation, specialising in redevelopment, planning and environmental impact assessment. During his career, Phil has worked directly for the mining and quarrying industry as a local government regulator and as a specialist planning and environmental consultant and gained a broad range of experience and a diverse skill set. In his current role, Phil leads up the Scottish Office of Hargreaves Limited, the property development arm of Hargreaves Services, and is involved in the redevelopment of a large brownfield land portfolio for commercial, industrial and housing uses, along with growing strategic development land pipeline. Tonight's presentation is on the Westfield. Westfield, which has been described as the largest open cast mine in the UK, operated on the site of the former Kirkness Colliery. Work at Westfield started in 1960 and produced 20,000 tonnes per week, approximately 40% of Scotland's open cast output. It was originally operated by Costain Mining on behalf of the National Coal Board, Coal Board Open Cast Executive, and between 1961 and 1985, Costain mined 34 and a half million tonnes of coal the operation left two large voids behind and created a new hill in the south of the site. Hargreaves acquired the site in 2013 after its former owners, Scottish Coal, were placed into liquidation and have been working to re redevelop the area as an industrial and business park, benefiting from various sources of green energy production. As part of the redevelopment legacy, main water pollution issues will be remediated along with the restoration of the residual parts of the site using green waste, compost and sewage sludge originating from within five to create a soil making material. A perfect example of how the circular economy works in action. Thank you, Phil. Thanks very much, Harry. Um, good evening, everybody. Apologies, I'm gonna to need to sit down so I can get on the, uh, the webcam. <laughs> Thanks very much for the introduction and thanks very much for inviting me here. I think that synopsis pretty much covers everything I'm going to say, so <laughs> they'll probably get away without saying it. Um, right. So just before I carry on, how do I get rid of this? Uh, there's a big noise. Ah, just can I just put that down there out of the way? Do. That'd be fine. Yeah, should just, yeah. yeah. Okay, right. Thanks very much. Right. Um, <laughs> sorry. Technical malfunction. Hopefully everything goes smoothly after this. No idea why. <laughs> Well, right. Thanks very much, Ian, and apologies for that. Um, right. Um, first of all, just like to give you um, a brief overview of what I want to talk about. Um, I'm conscious that there's quite a lot of slides in this presentation. Um, there's an awful lot of information to get to the, the site at Westfield and what Hargreaves are going to do with it and what it's going to become is quite a wide ranging topic. So what I've tried to do is pick out some of the more interesting things that will be of interest to guys from or people from the Mining Institute for Scotland and also the Institute of Quarrying. Um, quite a lot's happened on the site over the years and I'll, I'll just sort of run through those. Um, cover the site history, which is probably a, a fair proportion of the, the site. Um, look at the development opportunity when Hargreaves acquired it. As, as, as Harry said in the introduction, Hargreaves acquired the site back in 2013 when Scottish Gold went into liquidation. Um, look at the regulatory framework around the works that have been done. Um, look at the development proposals and processes. Cover some of the issues about community liaison because um, it, it, it's been a particular... Um, Issues the wrong way of putting it, but certainly communication with, with the local communities and all the stakeholders has been particularly important in making the, uh, the progress of the redevelopment of this site um, what it is. 
uh, look at some of the issues which may be of interest and have some common issues along with quarrying activities and then quickly run through where we currently are and then open it for, for questions. So Harry's already given that introduction a wee bit about me, so I don't need to do that again in the introduction, but suffice to say, I've been involved in um, minerals, mining, quarrying for well, well over 25 years, um, longer than I care to remember, really. Um, and uh, most of my working life has been spent on a sort of client side doing planning, environmental assessment and uh, managing assets, whether that be for, for quarrying companies or for coal mining companies and the waste management companies. So I do need to say all the views, if I do express any particular views, are not necessarily those of my employer today. Um, hopefully I won't say anything controversial. Um, depends on the questions Mark asks me at the end, I suppose. Right, a wee little bit about Hargreaves services, just to put things in context. So um, I work for Hargreaves Land, which is the property development arm of Hargreaves Services PLC, which is uh, an AIM listed um, group with about 1,250 employees. We've got a turnover of around 200 million pounds and net assets of around 140 million. Um, we've also got over 11,000 acres of land. Um, and we're, we're really split into to three main sections. So Hargreaves Land manages the land. Hargreaves Industrial Services um, still provides a service to the used to provide a service, I should say, to the coal mining industry in terms of a cradle to grave. Um, they would source coal, uh, feed it into the thermal power stations, principally down in the Ur Valley, and then uh, deal with the, the residues off the back end of that. Um, Blackwell Engineering, Blackwell Plant is a, a specialist civil engineering contractor. And um, the ones at the bottom, really maxi bright, is, is, is a coke production. Um, and then Hargreaves Asia is a consultancy business. And we also have a, a contract with uh, Chinese Light and Power in Hong Kong to provide the, the coal there uh, for, the, for the power station. Um, the three main pillars of the business, as I said, Hargreaves Land Services, and particularly one I did forget to mention before, European um, Raw Materials. Um, which is principally involved in um, carbon pulverization and also ferrous metal recycling. But in the UK, um, services, either through Blackwells or industrial uh, services, are, are the main operations along with Hargreaves Land. Um, Hargreaves Land is a property and regeneration specialist. We've got 20 chartered surveyors. Um, it's quite a lot for, for quite a small organization. and. Uh, a range of other associated professionals as well. And off the back of the, um, the coal mining, the surface coal mining business, we've been specializing in um, remediation of brownfield sites and particularly on the coal mine sites. Um, the assets that we acquired in Scotland at the time uh, ran to 18,000 acres and included some operational and non-operational open cast sites and also some restored open cast sites such as Blind wells across in East Lothian near Trenent, which is now being developed out as a housing site. We have planning consent on a master plan for 1600 houses. Um, current Hargreaves are doing the infrastructure works uh, using subcontractors, and currently we have uh, three builders on site um, building houses, and there's nearly 100 people living on blind wells now. Um, the site I want to talk about today, Westfield, is a, a site that we acquired as well. It's a former open cast site, former deep mine site as well, a long history, but that's now being repurposed for industrial and energy uses. Um, and then down south, we also have particularly want to pull out there is Unity, which is a, a joint development with Waystone, um, which is just off Junction 5 at the M18, just to the south of Doncaster, again, which is a large um, Mixed use development, including housing, industrial land, and uh, recreational uses. I'll skip through this because while it's in a standard presentation, I've probably covered most of it, and I don't think I really need to go on to that. And I'll just cut to the chase, really, and talk about Westfield, which I think is what people really wanted to, to hear about. Um, yeah, brief synopsis, which Harry read out earlier. So just to set the scene, uh, Westfield has in, in many different sources been described as the was the largest open cast mine in the UK and it operated on the site of the former Kirkness colliery. Um, it's located in Fife and um, just to the west of 
King Lassie and to the north of Carden Den. Um, tree mining work started in the 1950s and, and coal production during 1916 to 1961. And at its peak, um, it said it produced 20,000 tonnes of coal a week, which at the time represented 40% of Scotland's open cast output. Um, it was originally operated by Costain Mining on behalf of the National Coal Board, open cast executive. And between 61, 1961 and 1985, Costain excavated 34 and a half million tonnes of coal. Um, the operations left behind two large voids and created a new hill to the south of the site, which is where the bulk of the burden was placed. Um, I'll come on to, to talk about that a little bit later, but uh, that overburden was moved by conveyor and involved the, the uh, realignment of uh, the public road as well. So, um, as, as we said before, Hargreaves acquired the site in 2013 after the former owner Scottish Coal were placed into liquidation. And since that time, um, Hargreaves, myself and colleagues have been working uh, to redevelop the area as an industrial and business park. Um, hopefully to benefit from a variety of sources of green energy production. Um, there's already a small wind farm on site. There's uh, permission being granted for a solar array and there's currently an energy from waste plant being built on site. We're also looking at potential for um, taking heat from the mine water in the area and potentially um, also taking um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, put it in battery storage schemes uh, to benefit from the constrained power that will be generated on site. Um, as part of the redevelopment, there are certain legacy issues that uh, we're looking to remediate, that the main one being um, a mine water pollution issue, which has been a long-standing mine water pollution issue there. Um, and if you recall the, the slide, the, the first slide on the front, you'll have seen a, a very large void. And if I can just skip back to that, just to point that out. Sorry about that. Um, if you look at the, the, the photograph on the right hand side, you can see the, the void that was mined at pretty much near its maximum extent. And at the bottom, you can see the, uh, the ferruginous waters, uh, very, very ferruginous. And uh, that's led to some significant acidification in the, the water in the residual void, but more of that later. So apologies for skipping through. So, um, where is Westfield? It's located in um, Central Fife, as I said before, just to the west of King Glassy and north of Carden Den, um, right in the middle of Central Fife. And it was a former surface coal mine and former deep mine. And when Harvey's acquired it back in 2013, it was a, I suppose, best could be termed as a derelict industrial site. On that photograph in front of you, just to, to set the scene, um, don't know if you can see the cursor. Is that showing? No, apologies. <coughs> um, you've got the two large. Could you see that? No. No. <laughs> so that's a view looking principally from the west to the east, um, and in the foreground, you can see what looks like an industrial complex on the left-hand side. That's the former Lurgy plant, which was a coal gasification mm -hmm. plant to. But that's not within our site, but everything else beyond that is. So there are two large voids there, um, which are the residual um, voids from the, from the mining exercise. Just behind the Lurgy plant, you've got a series of coal stocking grounds, uh, former coal prep areas. And then in front of that, there's, there's two large bunkers. And then you can see um, there's a railway line running through the middle of the, um, the land between the two voids. Uh, there's a re-diverted burn through there, the Lochty burn, and also a railway line uh, that runs through, which goes off to the main line. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Ian. Thanks for trying anyway. Hopefully, I'll, the, the, the other photographs I'll be showing you show a bit more in, in detail, and it'll be easier to point out some of the features. But I just wanted to show you that to give you an idea of the scale. Um, the site is in excess of a 1,000 acres um, with two large water bodies. Um, this plan here was just put up to show our, our ownership of the site, that's Hargreaves Lands ownership, um, which extends, as I say, to just over a thousand acres. 
and encompasses two large water bodies, the site of the former Kirkness Colliery and also the, the site of the, the former Westfield Coal Processing Area. So I'd like to just go through a bit of the history because it does have quite a, a complicated and sort of long history um, on Westfield. So as was, was said before, um, mining started on the site that, that's now known as Westfield at Kirkness Colliery, um, which was located about three quarters of a mile to the southeast of Manalee's farm. Um, and I can point that out on the, sorry, I'm trying to point at the screen, it's not working. Um, which is just near the entrance to the site. Um, and it's not far from the, the Lockhaw Branch Railway Line, which linked to, to Cross Hill, Lockhaw and the Rosewell Pits, um, and which ran to the north of the old Westfield shafts. Um, there are two shafts within the, the former site. Um, that was at um, Kirkness Colliery, and they accessed down to the Capildray Parrot Coal. And it was believed that that was probably sunk by James Goodall of King Lassie in the early 1840s. Um, later mines to the northeast of this pit um, were shown as disused by 1896. Um, I'll just skip through. I can't really point that out. There's no way I can point to this, is there? Yeah, which isn't really going to work, is it? Because then people won't be able to see me on this. No, I'll, I'll, I'll try and talk you through it. Sorry. Um, there's a, in, in the middle of the site, you can see where it says Manalee's Pit, just to the south of the Ockhill Fault, which runs across the, the northern part of the site, which really is the end of the, the, the coal measures in, in that part of Fife. Um, and I'll show you a photo later where the, <clears throat> which shows the fault and the coal measures coming right up against the fault quite clearly. Capildray Colliery um, is just to the south of where it says Manalee's Pit and uh, more about that later. Hopefully you can, you can see that one a bit better. So that old, um, sorry. That photo, sorry, that old um, plan there, um, shows the location of Kirkness Pit. So it's just to the north of um, Capel J Colliery in, in the bottom end of the site. But what that photo, sorry, what that plan does show is a significant number of old pits in the area, um, and particularly in, the, in the, the area of Westfield. This is going to be quite hard. Again, these are this is just for historical context. And sorry, I can't point at this. Um, the old OS from 1895, which is showing disused coal pits in the area. The one in uh, 1897 is a bit better. So this is a, an extract from the OS 25, eight, sorry, 25 inch plan, which clearly to the south of Manalees, which is in the, the, the middle of the site. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So to the south of that, you can see um, where there's coal pit, which is uh, connected onto the, Onto, onto the railway line, uh, which, which took it away. And then you've got Kirkston, sorry, Kirkness House to the east. And you can see where King sits in relation to King Lassie. And while I was doing some research for this, I, I came across a lot of old quotes from um, the Dunfermline Press. So I've just put a few of these in here just to, to put things in context. So this was on the 28th of August in 1948 when um, Britain's largest pit was planned. I won't read it all out, but, but it's quite interesting to, to see that back then it was described as Britain's largest pit. Um, and the National Coal Board of the Sink, what you know, I consider to be, all, sorry, this was what um, Mr. L.H. Milligan, the area deputy manager of the NCB said, um, he considered it to be the Largest pit in Britain, a few miles to the east of Kelty on the lands of Westfield and Capeldray, which shows how important this area was for mining at the time. And also what a, a major investment opportunity, what a major investment it was uh, deemed to be. It was estimated that the new pit would eventually produce 8,000 tonnes of coal per day, which is a fairly significant tonnage, um, certainly in open cast terms. I'm, I've never come across a site, and I've worked in open cast mining for, for many years, certainly not in the UK that produced anything like that. 8,000 tonnes a week, maybe, but certainly not 8,000 tonnes a day. 
Um, of the several big coal developments projected in Fife, the Westfield scheme will be given priority over all others except for the Rothers. And then again, that's just, a, just to show you where the Capital J pits were. Um, again, in 1948, So work on the sinking of Westfield had begun um, and within, sorry, it was, was stated to have begun within the next two years and it was understood that the colliery would employ over 3,000 men uh, to house the miners, many of whom would be from the dying coal fields in West Scotland, the new town will be needed in the Balingary Bow Hill area and it's in the area between Rothers and the extreme west of Fife that uh, was the upper and lower coal mines exist. So this is Glen Rothers, uh, they were talking about Glen Rothers new town at that point. Again, this is just, a, I'll let you read them yourself, there's not much point in me reading it out, but it's just to show that there was, there was quite a lot happening and it was deemed to be quite a major investment. Um, Then in 1955, the Ministry of Fuel and Power have intimated they are to resume open cast coal operations soon from a site of the present excavations at Kinnemont Farm. So this is Westfield. So in 1955, workers started on the preparation of the new open cast coal site to the west side of the village of King's Lassie. The topsoil in a field at the farm of Manalese has been removed prior to the arrival of large excavators. It's planned that over 10 million tonnes of coal will be removed from the site in the next 15 years and the excavations will be over 700 foot deep. And they certainly did get to that depth, uh, but significantly more than the 10, 000, sorry, 10 million tonnes of coal was mined. Um, interestingly, uh, after the coal has been removed, the site will not be restored to its original state, but it will be restored to an ornamental park with a lake and will be laid out with trees, shrubs and walks. Um, just, just keep that thought in mind later on when we talk about the restoration of the site. And the present road from King Lassie to Loch Gelly leaving will be rerouted uh, south of the huge project. So interestingly in 1955, it's, it's amazing how things changed over the, the next 20 to 30 years about restoration and the, the acceptance that a large void could be left and particularly what was done with the, with the overburden and where it was moved to. Um, that shows the the site in 1956, uh, you can still see Chapel Drake, sorry, I was pointing again, you can still see Chapel Drake Colliery to the south and then the old pits located in the middle of the site. And this is the, the next to last um, bit from the, from, from the local press. So in 1956, the largest open cast coal project in Europe is starting. So it was not only the largest in the UK, but allegedly the largest in, in Europe at that time. So giant electric shovels, each capable of shifting nine tons of earth and rubble at one bite, a part of the remarkable machinery and plant which are to be used at the site in the development work in connection with the new open cast coal project near King Lassie. Um, I guess nine tons would be about four and a half cube, yeah. something like that. So it's amazing how small those buckets were in comparison to what was being used at the end, where certainly a, a 12 cubic meter bucket wasn't unusual and would be the norm on a site. The largest operation of its kind to be undertaken in Europe, this project by the Owncast executive is expected to produce between 20 and 30 million tonnes of coal and provide employment for hundreds of people over the next 20 years. Certainly went on for a bit more than that. Um, so part of the land which the coal will be withdrawn will eventually become a loch. So it's interesting to note that that was always the plan. Um, certainly that seems to have been forgotten. Um, in various consultations and discussions we've had with people over the last few years. Um, for the coal seams in part are uh, 90 feet deep. It must be a mistake. Bogside, instead of being a marshy wetland, will become um, sound land surrounding a lock. And great stress has been laid upon this. And that part of the project is being supervised by the Department of Agriculture. And then interestingly um from 1960 filling in a valley now unfortunately this is the best photograph i've got um in the photo in in the foreground you can see there's a hill and there's two lines of shelter belts which 
which are trees up. There are some other photos later, but that hill to the south of the Westfield site is where all the overburden went and it was transported over there by conveyor. Um, so it was obvious that the intention was never to use that to infill those voids, which currently now are in excess of 70 meters deep, uh, the, the one to the north is. But um, just quite interesting how um, it was used as an opportunity to create a, a new land form and that the material was actually strategically thought about where it was going to be placed and it was moved in the most, I guess, economically advantageous way by, by using conveyor. <coughs> This is the final uh, OS sheet I'm, I'm going to show you, which is from 1956, which clearly you can see in there, there's a, there's a large area to the, um, the right-hand side of that plan, um, which is where all the peat was stored um, on the side uh, in preparation uh, for the excavation. You can see that the, the road has been diverted at that point and uh, ready for operations to commence. That's really what it looks like, or that's what it looked like um, around 2015. And this, you can clearly see where the, where the, where the peat traps were on that photo. Um, conscious that there's, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of photos there to get to, and without being able to point it, I can't really explain it very well. Um, in, in doing some digging, I found this, um, this information, it was, it was a booklet that was produced by Costain um, called Westfield Open Pit. Now, I apologise for the quality of that, but when you look at the size of that excavation there, um, it, it, it was certainly a very large undertaking and it reached um, in almost 200 metres deep uh, at its maximum. I won't run through too much here. It was really just for, um, just to sort of show people, you know, what was used and, and how the, the operations were, were undertaken. If you look at that slide there, you can clearly see that rope uh, wheeled excavator. I think Mark knows exactly what they are. Yeah, we are B-150 and I take some of the line. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for that, because that, that, that's, that's not my speciality. But that slide there clearly shows the, the, the extent of the, the void when Westfield was uh, running at a pump and the the section below shows the the structure across the basin it's a long section across so the coals were worked in a, an individual basin so it was the bog lochty basin which was slightly isolated and, and that's where all of the coal at westfield came from and um, when it was mined um i can make all of this information available to people if they'd like to read it at the leisure i think there's far too much information to try and run through today but it's quite interesting looking at this when you look at the plant that was used um, you know, the size of the excavations, you know, the, the planning that was done or, um, at the time. This slide here, um, what it shows, the, the plan there shows the broad phasing. It was really worked in three large phases, working from the south to the north. Um, and below that, you can clearly see there's a, there's a photograph of the conveyor, which was taking the overburden out of the excavation and to... Um, the area at Her Hill, which is a couple of kilometres south of the main Westfield site, where it was all used to infill a valley and then create a large hill. Um, that is a plan of the um, showing the, the, the contours for the landform that was going to be created, which actually it, it's a fairly prominent local feature. And again, there's uh, some photographs there of some of the plant and the conveyor discharging the material. And you can start to see in the in the photo on the left hand side the, the landform starting to emerge. And when you look at it on plan form on the OS, it really looks a bit like a trilobite. Um, you know, for those geologists amongst you, but it's, it's it's quite a stunning feature. And most local people, when you speak to them, don't know that that's where that came from. And actually, I think it was really done well, particularly with the shelter belts. And uh, yeah, while it's a prominent feature, I think a lot of people would be hard pressed to know where it came from. Again, um, this is just showing the, uh, identifying the various features in the area, indicating where the Oak Hill Fault is and where the pits lie uh, in relation to that and where the Kirkness Pit is. And then 
another shot, which you've already seen, which is showing the maximum extent of the, of the operations. Um, this void that you can see there forms the, the northern pit lake, which I'll show you on, on, on future slides as we move forward. Um, but it's important to, to recognize that just to understand the scale of that void, which has been mostly backfilled, but at the, at the western end, and we're looking towards the west, so at the western margin of that, um, it still goes down to nearly 70 meters um, and hasn't been backfilled. There's, there's, there's an awful lot of water in there. Again, just some shots to show the equipment uh, that was used in the excavation, and that again is looking off to the west. You can see the, the stack from the, the Lurgy plant, which is sitting, um, it looks as though it's sitting right on the limit of the excavation, but it's not, it, it's, it's quite a way back. But to the right hand side of that, you can see the conveyors which fed the uh, reception hoppers, um, which were used to hold coal. It's not only uh, because Westfield operated as a, a regional distribution point as well. So coal from other private licensed mines in the wider area was brought into Westfield and it was uh, put into those hoppers before being transferred off to the, the coal processing plant and just below the wheels on the, the arm, the boom of the, the excavator, you can see the conveyor running pretty much, it looks as though it's running pretty much horizontally, but that's the conveyor that was taking the coal, the product then over to the railway lines, which was sitting on the Southern part of the site. And the bulk of the coal did leave the site uh, via train. These photos here um, are looking from South to North and what they're showing there are is the the reception hoppers um, which are which are still on site and coal would come in if it was coming in by by road would come in from the north turn onto the um, hard standing there disgorge its load which would then be pushed into a over a grizzly down into a small bunker went up a conveyor and then was discharged into those two large bunkers which are approximately um, 25 meters across, about 25 meters deep, and about between 50 and 60 meters uh, long. So, so very large features. And uh, the coal would sit in those. It would it would come out of the come out of the bottom, go onto a conveyor, and then would be fed into the processing plant, which is sitting in front. And then you can see the conveyors taking the coal away. Um, Again, the, the second photo shows that just from a different angle. Um, again, slide showing uh, the features on site. You can see those two reception hoppers and the coal processing plant, but to the right-hand side of those, you can see the coal stopping areas. That's part of the site where there was no mining undertaken, but it's also part of the redevelopment. And this is where some of the industrial developments going to go on later. And the whole reason for showing you all this is so you can see the development of the site and you can get a better understanding of the constraints we had to work with when we were looking to redevelop the site and come up with the plans to do that. Um, again, apologies if this is getting a bit repetitive, but I do find these photos quite fascinating. And I know everybody else might not, but you, know, you don't often get to see these things and if some of you in here might remember them i don't know if anybody does no i certainly work with people who've worked on the plant there um, at the tail end of the days and this is a view before the site was formally uh, abandoned and that's showing uh, what you can see there is the uh, sequence of, of seams in the eastern wall at the, the far side of the void, and you can start to see them turning up as they come up onto the Ockill Fault, which is running, sorry, I can't really explain it very well, but, but essentially running into the in, in, into the photograph, and you can see how the, the coals are turned up. That's a view, again, looking back across the site. Uh, this was taken in 20. 09 and you can see the in the foreground this is the the overburden that came out of that void and you can see the large void to the north um, which is still there the one to the south was actually infilled over much of its extent and um, probably two-thirds of it were, were backfilled so it's probably only two meters below uh, 
ground level, but there was a small excavation left at one end, which does go down to about 30 meters. Um, it holds water um, seasonally, and it was later engineered by Scottish Coal as a landfill cell. Uh, they had plans to um, turn the site into a, a landfill and, and also a materials reclamation facility as well to, to pre-saw the material before, before it was infilled. These are photos across the site taken, again, during the 2010s, the 10, 11 and 13, I think they were taken, but this is showing the, this is the, the former coal stocking areas, which is lying to the immediate um, east of the coal prep area and, and hoppers and bunkers. This one probably shows it a bit better. This is looking from the south to the north. You can see the stack on the left hand side from the um, Lurgy plant, that's pretty much all that's left of it now. And in the foreground um, was where the coal prep plant was. Um, you can see a series of lagoons, water treatment lagoons, um, which have some of the thickest concrete I've ever seen, um, along with the, the access road, which was laid down. Sorry, I'm pointing at the screen again with the cursor to try and show where that runs through. But certainly things were engineered properly back in those days. Um, the road was laid in concrete slabs and when we were doing the SI work through the site we, we put down cores to see how thick it was. Um, the access road is between 450 and 500 thick um, and the coal stocking area down there by the railway lines is 600 thick with two layers of inch rebar in it. Um, that's now 70 years old and it doesn't look like it's deteriorated at all. Um, another shot across the site showing the two voids. Um, the, the material between them is actually open cast backfill, so that's all been backfilled. Uh, those two voids are in hydrological connectivity, so water does flow through. But interestingly, you've, also, you've got the railway line and you've got the Lochty Burn rerouted through that backfill between those two voids. And more on the issue of the Lochty Burn later. Um, you can see two of the four wind turbines that have been erected on site. And that's just a view of the southern pit lock. Um, you can see just in front of the turbines, there's what looks like a, a ramp going down and everything beyond that is, is where the, the void is still deeper. Coming back towards us on that photograph, mm -hmm. that's probably only two meters deep at its most maximum. Um, it, used to sort of, um, it used to dry seasonally, but it doesn't anymore. It's pretty wet. Um, all year round now and it does have some problems with its water quality um, as does the, the, the pit lock to the north. Again just to, to put it in scale and context that's a, a site showing the, the two pit locks uh, the one to the north and the one to the south which you can see in, in, at that stage is, is pretty much dry although there is the, the larger uh, the deeper area um, in the foreground. Um, for anybody that gets hold of a copy of the presentation, I won't go into this now, but this is quite an interesting feature on here. Um, it's a virtual tour of the site. So what we did is when we were doing our original SIs, we put a drone up and we set it in several different locations across the site. So it's almost like Google Earth for Westfield. So you can zoom in, pan, scale over various parts of the site. And actually it was a, it was a, it was a real boon for, for trying to understand the features um, on site. So this is what it looked like when Hargreaves acquired it in 2013. And you know, what were we going to do with it? Because Hargreaves acquired a mixed bag of um, assets from Scottish coal. Uh, as I said before, some operational open cast sites and the intention was to continue mine coal. And um, back in 2013, there was still quite a lot of coal being used in the UK. We still had a power station burning in Scotland. Um, but very shortly after Hargreaves acquired it, um, things like the large combustion, sorry, large plant combustion directive bit, government policy change, we were moving to decarbonize the economy and trying to work the coal to fund the restoration of some of these sites just wasn't an option anymore. So that led us to radically rethink what we were going to do with some of these sites. But Westfield was always seen as one where we could um, develop and build upon 
the existing um, infrastructure which was in place um, to try and come up with something which could uh, see it continuing to, to operate and provide um, something for the economy for, for the next hundred years, you know, as it already had been as, as a mining site. Um, as I said before, we had a thousand acres plus brownfield mining site. It was one of the largest vacant and derelict sites in Scotland. It's relatively remote, but it's also incredibly well connected. You're only three miles away from Junction 5 of the M90. There's a safeguarded railway line with connections to the Ryder uh, rail network out at Thornton on, on the Five Circle in place. Um, through promoting the site with the uh, Five Council and the development plan, we managed to get it uh, designated for industrial waste and green energy uses. There's a significant grid capacity adjacent to the site, which you can see um, in this slide here which is on the, the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, that's the, the Westfield primary sub. Um, there was an opportunity to enhance the existing habitats, which uh, featured quite widely in the uh, local biodiversity action plan. And this was principally around the areas where peat had been stripped and put into large peat baths. And it had started to regenerate as both it certainly wasn't active peat bog, but it's certainly been considered good quality um, wet heath. And it has a function not only as a, as a habitat for priority species, but also it is starting to fix oxygen. There are pockets of sphagnum and it's starting to, to sequestrate carbon again. Um, it gave us an opportunity to try and improve legacy mine water issues. Where Westfield sits in the river or catchment at the top end, it had been historically one of the most polluted sites on the, the coal authorities register. Um, and we'll come on to that in, in a minute and uh, the, the issues surrounding that and what we're gonna do about it. And also there's a significant amount of existing infrastructure that could be reused. Um, I pointed out those concrete lagoons before, which um, are massive structures. Um, the original intention was to break them out and take them all away. But actually when you've got a structure that's fulfilling its function that well, then it was decided we would leave them in place, refurb them and then use them for the suds and the drainage on the site. Um, you know, all that carbon has been expended, uh, putting that concrete in place, why not make maximum use of it? So that was a wee bit of sort of history about um, the site and our thinking after we acquired it, what we were going to do with it. So in terms of, uh, national planning policy at the time uh, it was national planning framework four we've now gone beyond that um, and what that was trying to promote was successful sustainable places low carbon places natural resilient places and connected places and actually the site at westfield and the proposals to redevelop it for green energy uses accorded with all of the national planning policy and also uh, the scottish planning policy at the time it no longer exists um, so we'd promoted the site through the, the Fife plan and we'd got it designated um, in the plan there, um, which was, um, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't too difficult because in terms of its size, and as I said before, it was one of the largest uh, vacant and derelict brownfield sites in Scotland. Um, there wasn't an awful lot could be done with it, despite what some people thought. Uh, and there was an expectation that the voids would be filled in and it would be put back to what it was before. You know, as I mentioned earlier, even back in the 1950s, there was an expectation that this would not be filled in, it would be turned into a park. That never happened. Um, in some of the original documents, actually, the um, NCB wanted to hand it over to Kakodi District Council at the time, but they refused to take it. Um, what did happen, though, as some of you may be aware, if you you know, if you're local and you know the area, uh, Lockall Meadows was converted into a, a regional park instead. And at the time when this was offered to them, they didn't want this because they didn't need two parks in the area. And I think Lockall Meadows has been a fantastic reclamation job. And I think it could be an awful, it's an awful lot better product than, than Westfield could ever have been, principally because of the depth of the water and the issues surrounding it. Um, Lockall Meadows would probably make quite an interesting case study as well. In terms of the guiding uh, principles of the development, again, you know, these are all the things you would normally look at. And this is common with any form of development, whether this is for a redevelopment of an open cast site or a quarry or anything else. You know, you'd be looking at your government policy, you know, circular economy issues, um, 
climate emergency is something that, that's coming to us more and more so looking about issues of you know what can we do to, to assist with that you know how can we decarbonize how can we make maximum use and provide as many services as possible from the site and um, obviously restoration of uh, a legacy dereliction um, we've always taken a multi-stakeholder partnership approach when we do these developments because we find it you know, much easier to do that and that's why there's a section later on the presentation about community and um, stakeholders and uh, as i said before the the lbap had identified several priority species and habitats on site so we wanted to to maximize that and try and secure those um and the, the, you know we wanted to try and make use of the existing facilities on site so we came up with this um which is a schematic which is showing how the site could be developed. So what you have, if, you, if we start over on the, the right-hand side, there's the four wind turbines, which are already in place. Um, they've been there for 10 years now. Um, but to the, to the north of that, you have solar arrays, um, both on land and also on the water. And just to the south of those, a series of glass houses. Um, for, for food production and part of the reason for that is because that's a good use and it, it's a good use to coexist with the, the anchor development for the site which is a, an energy from waste plant and um, Fife Council has always had an aspiration to deal with their own waste within Fife and not export it um, it's very difficult to try and transport waste to other places now um, waste should be seen as a resource and not just as, as waste and something to get you know, to be gotten rid of and um, so as a byproduct of the energy from waste plant which is sitting as, as the anchor on the site then that will produce significant quantities of heat and also significant quantities of co2 and actually putting those into the glass houses enables us or enables someone to make use of that um, in, in agriculture whether that's hydroponics, vertical growing, or, or more traditional glass houses, certainly heat helps. And everybody knows, you know, at the moment, even from a domestic point of view, power isn't uh, isn't getting any cheaper, and uh, heat off the back of that is, is another source of income from the PFW. Um, as you can see, the development on there is predominantly over at the, the western end of the site, and there's quite a lot of the site that hasn't been restored. Um, which has been left as you know, some people may describe it as a moonscape, uh, burr, open cast, backfill. Mm. Um, some of it has, some of it hasn't. It's principally around the, the peat baths where the, the decent habitat has, has developed. But over the rest of the site, there's quite a lot of work to be done. And there isn't the material on site to be able to deal with that. So in terms of the master plan we pulled together, um, that shows a 250 acres of employment land with an emphasis on green energy generation and business, general, industrial and distribution uses. Um, we were looking to develop it up into plots of, of various sizes. Um, as I said before, it's, it's close to the motorway network. It's got a safeguarded rail line and with the on-site CHP uh, facility and the solar array, there's potential to meet all the energy needs for anyone who wants to, to locate on site particularly having the, the rail line there and the large power generation um, possibilities. You know, it was seen as a, a pretty decent site for people to, to move into our large power requirements. Um, and also, as I said before, you know, making maximum use of existing infrastructure. So the master plan was pulled together and a planning application made back in 2016. Uh, which included a fully scoped DIA, which included all of the, the normal things you'd expect to see in any application of this nature, landscape and environmental impact assessments, noise assessments, the ecology, transport, traffic, hydrogeology, a particular issue here, flood risk assessments, uh, health impacts, which was also covered again by the PPC permit application, environmental permit. And interestingly here, a standalone landscape and ecological management plan, uh, which was pulled together to, to show how we would restore the parts of the site that weren't going to be used for development. And then sit into the bottom, something which came out through the planning process, um, Lochteburn Water Quality Improvement Scheme, which we something we worked up along with the Coal Authority, SEPA and Fife Council. So that led to the development of this master plan here. 
um, which shows all the elements which were in the schematic. And this slide here shows uh, a CGI of what it could look like if it was developed out in strict accordance with the master plan. So what you can see there's a mass of buildings representing the EFW um, just to the north of the railway lines, plus some, some sheds, some glass houses, and then the two elements of the, the solar arrays. So, and then again, this slide just shows um, what the development areas you know, could look like. So in terms of the various elements on site and the things we're looking to put there, uh, the first is the, the CHP, Energy from Waste Facility. Um, so this project has been developed with a company called Brockwell Energy, who used to be part of Hargreaves. Um, when Hargreaves acquired the assets of, of Scottish Coal, there were, there were several renewable energy projects underway. Um, Hargreaves took those forward, um, but then decided to, to bundle them all together in an SPV called Brockwell Energy because these are very capital intensive projects to deliver. I mean, you know, to give you an idea, an energy from waste plant like this for CapEx would probably be 250 million or thereabouts. Um, solar array, again, the one that's shown on there, even if you just did a bit on land, which is 80 acres, that's a, a 30 megawatt facility. You know, again, you're looking around 40 million pounds in terms of CapEx to develop those things out. Um, but Hardly still own all the land, options were put in place and, and these things are going to be developed out. So in terms of the, the CHP project, because there are various sorts of energy from waste facilities out there, you know, it's, it's proven technology. Um, it was designed to, you know, not like some of the gasification plants, which don't necessarily work uh, straight away. 200,000 ton plant using RDF, which is a refuse derived fuel, um, Long-term solution by 2020 to adhere to the zero waste directive. Um, that's now moved back to 2025, as I'm sure you're all aware, because we don't have the facilities uh, currently to deal with that. But it's certainly still an aspiration for the government to ensure that nothing goes to waste, nothing goes to landfill after 2025. Um, Long-term private wire energy supply agreements can be agreed to reduce energy costs. The plant will produce 21 megawatts of energy, um, and that can be amended to produce uh, various um, sorts of heat as well. So superheated steam or you know, various degrees of water uh, for any user. Obviously, the more heat you put out, the less electricity you'll, you'll generate, but ground wire connection could also be available to, to occupiers on site. The plant's gonna operate for 8,000 hours a year, and it has the facility for backup boilers to ensure that uh, it can continue to provide electricity during um, peak demand and, and when it's shut down for, for essential maintenance. That's uh, some elevations of what this will look like. Um, it's not particularly, so it's just really a series of boxes with, with a large chimney, um, but you know, waste will be brought in, goes in one end into uh, negative pressure doors, tipped into a bunker where it's lifted up on the conveyors and then it's uh, taken away for, sorry, not taken away, it's dropped into the, uh, the internet and it's burnt and that produces heat and steam. Um, in terms of the various supports, I'm conscious of time, I've kind of gone on a wee bit here. Into five, right, okay. I'll whistle through the rest, apologies. I did say it was quite a lot to try and cover in, in the time. So in terms of supporting information, we've got this mining risk assessment. I'll, I'll really will whiz through these uh, that was undertaken. That also included uh, looking at the, the hydrogeological dynamics of the, of the site, which is the mine water treatment issues. Um, the normal things you'd expect to see there, composite mining plans on that drawing there, you can see the green line represents the extent of the former surface coal mining and the two blue ringed lines are the extent of the workings in the Capital J colliery um, under the, the site. Um, this is a, a plan showing environmental constraints we needed to consider uh, when we were pulling together the plans, the, the brown in the middle is the backfill information. So backfill information, sorry, uh, backfill material. Um, again, I'll quick through these. Uh, this shows the ground investigations on site, and that's a call to the, the concrete road. Um, 
one of the things we did have to deal with is there are twin high pressure gas mains running across the main access road. Um, not unusually, um, SDN had no records of any of the protection that was put in place. So we had to go in and do SI works to uncover what protection was put in place. Um, and that initially we did that via uh, LIDAR and then we actually had to um, hand excavate around there and set down boreholes, um, which was, was quite an interesting exercise to go through. But I'll nip through the flood risk assessment and come on to the Lochty Burn Water Quality Improvement Scheme, which is one of the things I really did want to touch on. Um, the large void to the north um, contains the area of the former coal stocking area. When operations ceased and mine water started to recharge and, and it filled back in, that left a water quality issue in the northern pit lake. The water in the top 20 metres is pretty much uh, neutral, so pH 6.5 to pH 7. But below that, it does get incredibly acidic. So once you're below 20 metres, the pH of that water falls as low as 2.8 in some of the samples. Um, that water's moving across the site from south to north. Uh, it does, um, the, the, we haven't seen any evidence recently, but there has been, I believe, evidence in the past where um, the stratification has started to set up currents and so on that water moves about. Um, so we wanted to come up with a long-term solution about how we could deal with that. Um, this plan just shows the, uh, the monitoring points on the, the northern pit lake. The water level is an awful lot deeper than that at the moment, but what that does show is the structure of the, the, the excavation and the, and the road running from north to south. Again, um, this can obviously be made available to anyone that wants it, but you know, as I said, the lowest pH was, was 2.8, um, which was down at 62 metres, so it's quite a depth for that. And, that while that water isn't moving about, it's not such a problem, but there is finiginous water at a higher level. And what's causing another problem in the Lochty Burn is as this water moves across um, along the gradient, what it does do is it leaches through the backfill where the Lochty Burn sits, and it's leaching iron out of the, the backfill material, which is depositing it into the Lochty Burn, which is creating a, a pollution issue. And that's one we're going to sort um, in several ways. Um, Firstly, by treating water that comes into the site off the old overburden mound to the south, which is picking up iron as it runs through, going into the Capildray burn, comes into the site, we'll put in place some reed beds to extract some of that iron. But we are looking to lower the water level in the large pit lake by two metres. Uh, we've spent quite a lot of time talking to SEPA and the Coal Authority about that, so we can drop that water level, which will stop that. Um, movement, that lateral movement of water and stop the, the water moving through and leaching and dropping it into the burn. Um, sorry, uh, interestingly, uh, the landscape and ecological management plan, and um, what you can see there on that drawing is the brown areas in the middle of areas where there were there was no soils and these were areas we'd identified that were suitable for treatment. So what we did is already using waste from Fife from uh, leaf and mouth sewage works, we took sewage sludges and compost from Fife Council uh, from Dunfermline. We mix that together along with some clean water sludges and also some wood finds and mix that with the overburden to create a, a new soil, which has gone down there and we've seeded that up. Um, we are looking to potentially plant some trees on that or ultimately get, to, get some animals on there to graze it, but I'll quickly wheat through that and show you some of photos in a minute. Um, in terms of community liaison, nothing happened on site until 2021, but we set the com community liaison committee up in 2018. And that's a list there showing who's all involved in the community liaison committee. And we felt it was important to do that well in advance of any of the operations to ensure that anything we wanted to do um, was well communicated with all the local communities. And when we did lodge the application, um, there weren't very many apps sorry, objections at all. And those that we did receive in the main were about uh, traffic and transportation, particularly on the South Lock Road, which comes off junction five of the M90 into Westfield. So one of the things that the local community had asked us to do was to consider putting in place a, a new track, which could be used for cycling or walking, which would run parallel to the road. Now, what we did is we commissioned a, a study, which has grown it's actually morphed into something else altogether now. 
um, it was a feasibility study originally to look to see whether or not we could put in place this access road, um, very, very diverse, multiple land ownerships. Um, turns out that it's probably not the easiest thing to do, but what it has turned into is an access strategy, looking at linking all of the communities together and seeing what opportunities there are for creating new footpaths to link um, Loch Gelly, Carden Den, Balingri and um, King Glassy, and also look at potentially diverting a section of the Pilgrim's Way, which is a new long distance footpath, which runs along a three kilometer section of the road. It's probably the worst section of it, but if we can flip that into the Westfield site, that would be seen as a benefit. Um, one of the things I did want to, so this is the, I'll come back to the, the sewage sludge um, in terms of the lemp. That shows you what the site looked like before we'd done any work. So you can see there, it's just bare overburden rock. It doesn't look particularly you know, good. So that was taken uh, six months later after the application of sludges, composts and seeding. Um, it's still looking like that now. So that work was done during spring and summer 2020. I'll nip through that bit. One of the other things that's come out of this, um, that slide, oh, sorry. There's been a historic flooding problem in King Lassie, which lies downstream from uh, the Westfield site. And back in 2020, in August 2020, it suffered a catastrophic flood. There was a one in 200 year event um, and it flooded right the way through the middle of the village. Um, it flooded half a dozen houses on Burnside and also the houses at, uh, uh, adjacent to the, to the road in the, in the middle of the site, um, at Medwell's Court. Um, we were asked if there's anything we could do to assist. Uh, so what we have done on site is we um, undertook an assessment to see whether or not we could hold water back on site and effectively create a large suds basin. Um, there are two culverts that uh, cross the Lochty Burn in the middle of the site. And effectively what we've done is the downstream culvert. We've choked. So that, that, that slide there shows the, on the right hand side, you can see the extent of the original culvert and how that's been choked down. Um, this photo might show it a bit more clearly. So essentially a large, a small diameter, smaller diameter pipe has been put in there and that's been backfilled and it has, it, it's, it's, it's fulfilling its purpose. This, this work was done last year. Um, it has the capacity to hold back 50 million liters of water um, on, a, on a temporary basis and basically take the, uh, the peaks out of any flood events. So quickly into current position, um, work started on site by Brockwell building the EFW plant um, in January, uh, 2022. Um, and then we started uh, in 2022 in April as well, just doing the infrastructure works, basically providing the, the road and getting in the utilities. Um, that's a view looking from the, the north to the south across the former coal stocking areas. Um, that's a slide showing what the, the various configuration for the development platforms is, but also some of the excavators doing some of the work on the first phase, which is the former coal stocking area. There isn't actually an awful lot of work to do there. It's really taking off the coal carpet, um, encapsulating that elsewhere on site, and then recompacting the material up to, to an appropriate burning capacity. I'll skip through that. This is really more marketing type materials. Um, this is showing what the site looked like in August of last year. That's a CGI. Uh, which doesn't really help. Um, you can see the, the, the new road coming in. You can see how the, the material has been moved. This is a view down on the, the EFW plot. Um, what you can see in the middle there is the just from starting to excavate out for the bunker, which is now fully in place. Um, and that they've backfilled against that and they're just starting to do all the prep works. You can see the new road that's gone in to, to service that. Um, again, just a copy of the, the master plan, uh, identifying a potential phase two for the development, which would obviously be subject to planning, but as a result of the Lochty Burn Water Quality Improvement Scheme and dropping the water level by two metres, what it will do is it'll dry up that area and make it suitable for the importation of inert materials. Let's skip through that. This uh, just some slides of what the, 
the energy from waste plant will look like. Um, don't know whether this will work. That's just a little video um, to show you the, the extent and, and, and scale of this. Um, also on site, we have uh, the Ventian wind farm, um, four turbines, 10 megawatts of installed capacity, um, consent's been granted for a 30 megawatt, 80 acre solar array. We're also looking at opportunities for, for battery storage uh, schemes on site. Um, we're, we're currently speaking to a couple of potential um, developers who are looking to speculatively build glass houses on site, um, Dutch companies, um, and also looking at uh, a potential uh, D and B on some warehousing sheds. Um, the last slide here is a marketing video, which I won't show you. Um, if that's okay, just conscious of time, I'll just skip through that. Sorry about the timing. Yeah. Is that concept true for each of the individual components within the scheme? Sorry, what? Oh, right, you mean the EFW would be subsidy fee? Yeah. Well, right. Well, in terms of this development, uh, there's been no public money put into this at all. So it's all private money, whether that's Hargreaves land or Rockwell and their, their funders. When's the plan due for completion? Well, the energy from waste yeah. plant. Yeah, so that was a th it's a 36 month build program. They started in at the end of January last year. So if everything goes to plan and they tell us they're still on target, uh, it would be sort of spring 2025. It's uh, th there's quite a lot going on site at the moment. So they're, they're out of the ground now, the concrete bunker for, for the waste and the reception hall is completed, steel's moving on site. Um, for the construction of the, the building that will be around it. And uh, they've had about 70 or 80 people on site up to now, but it, that will go up to 400. So that'll take all the waste from five. Can the opportunity extend that to Orleans as well? Well, um, all I can say is that it will take up to 200,000 tonnes of RDF a year. Um, it's not a Harvey's facility. It, it, it's, it's a Brockwell Energy facility. I know that Fife Council very much want to deal with their waste in Fife and not export it anywhere else, but they don't produce 200,000 tonnes of waste a year. So there will be opportunity for other waste to go in there. Okay. Where's the energy going to go to? It's being produced. Right, so uh, the default position, well, it will be go straight into the grid and you can see there's the large substation sitting next door, just on the other side of the road. Um, as I understand things, it will stack up to do that, to sell it into the grid. Um, the grid connection secured, and that will be available from 2025. But there's obviously opportunities for large power users who come on site to benefit from a brown wire connection or virtual PPAs you know, for, from Brockwell for that purpose. Ideally, what we'd like to see is somebody come on site that wants to use that power. Um, and we have been in discussion with a, a wide range of potential occupiers uh, who are who, who really this is this is the main USP for that. And there's two main things people like about the site when you speak to them when we've been doing the marketing. One, they like the story. They like the fact that it's a, an old open cast site. It's being restored. It's being greened up using waste effectively. You know, it's, it's waste energy that uh, so it's not waste energy, it's waste creating energy, which can create new jobs. But also they like the, the bit about potential food growing on site. And if you think about what would happen after people eat the food, you know, without going into too much detail, that ends up back at Leave and Mouth Works again. That's then taken out of there as sludge, that's brought back on site and that helps to green up the rest of the site. So that's a 15 year rolling program. We've done the first few phases. So, you know, in, in some way, it's kind of truly circular. 
You know, if you've got Fife's waste being used to create heat and CO2 to grow food in Fife for people to eat, to then use that to restore the site and you know, round and round it goes again. And there's also opportunities to take the IBA, the incinerator bottom ash that comes out of that process and use that as a, a secondary aggregate. Um, in an ideal world, you know, that would be able to be used to create some of the infrastructure on Westfield and then the waste's actually starting to build the permanent infrastructure. Could you tell me, given that uh, the subsequent uses of the land, did that reduce the burden of remediation or did it increase the burden? Um. I think it did. I mean, if I take you back to the the assumptions that were made, or actually the, the position we're back, you know, when this site was originally planned as an open cast site in the 50s, it was never the intention that it would be restored. So it was always going to be left as a large lake. Now, whether they intended that to be as deep as it was, I don't know. But certainly the fact that they moved most of the overburden, you know, two kilometres, two and a half kilometres to the south and put it in a large mound. Um, I think there's well, there was certainly an understanding from the council that that was never going back in there. So what can we do with the void? So the first thing is we need to clean it up and we need to get rid of that historic mine water issue, mine water pollution issue. Um, in an ideal world, if dropping the water level in the northern pit lake by two metres does that and it dries up the bottom half, it gives us the opportunity to create more land for development. And if we can do that and that brings more economic activity into Fife and creates more jobs, that would be seen as a good thing. But everything that's not part of the development, which is on the west hand side of the site, will be restored. Now, whether that's through the importation of sludges and composts and greening it up, or whether that's just maintaining the existing habitats by, in some instances, doing nothing and ensuring nothing happens to the world, some maybe doing things like blocking up drains and ensuring the hydrological conditions stay right in, in the peat trap. We'll also be creating a network of paths on site and also putting in place some interpretation because there's, there's, there's quite a lot happened here. You know, when you think about, you know, coal really did power the industrial revolution and, you know, Scottish coal was pretty good quality coal. And the fact that this site has provided, you know, it's been an economic engine for, for this part of life for you know, hundreds of years. And with the opportunity to create power on site restore itself and create more jobs and then hopefully it can go on for a lot longer. I know that probably didn't answer the question directly, but there was an expectation that we would restore the rest of the site, which we will do. It won't happen overnight, but it's a 15 year program through so this the LEMP document, and we've done the first few phases. Um, as and when we get more occupiers and as and when we generate more cash, we'll, we'll do further phases. But in terms of greening up the site, that's just, we are limited to an extent by the amount of sewage sludge one that's available and two we can secure and also compost we can secure but again that's a great use for materials which otherwise you know might have to be sold and you know farmers might want to what storage water tries to do is sell that material and treat it now to farmers they can't always do that because they create more than they've actually got a market for and in terms of the green waste compost that five council that we've been taking five council this is from all of their parks and recreation areas and just the road signs that they, they, they cut all this, take it to the infirmary and compost it. But they've got more than they know what to do with it. They've been using it to help restore some of their landfill sites, but there comes a limit to how much compost you can put down. So actually taking that to create the organic material to mix in with the open cast backfill, you know, and get that organic compound you know, component back in along with clean water sludges. Um, on some of the sites we've been doing, the farm we've also been using um, wood fines. It's it's quite a good way of creating a, a, a new growing medium with new soil. And again, it's using waste to create something. Yeah. It's, it's an observation rather than a, a question. Uh, there seems to be so much material there, of course, there's a, a massive, varied project that's in the merits of these problems to do this. There's, there's so much involved. There's an observation, you know, I'm really impressed with but, but, but that's the same with you know, not just this, but some of the other sites we've mm -hmm. got where 
we've developed them out as, as onshore wind farms and we're now looking at putting in green hydrogen production, battery storage schemes, planting trees on the areas we've restored using waste to sequestrate carbon as well and also to create community woodlands. So there's, there's quite a nice story about this isn't the only site we've got. It's probably the most complicated one and probably has the most diverse uses. But we're doing this on some of the others as well. I mean, Dalhwandi was always quoted as being one of the, the biggest sites. You know, that's the one down in South Lanarkshire near Colburn. Um, and again, that's got a wind farm on it. Again, we're, we're planting trees on there to sequester carbon, uh, battery storage schemes, and actually bits back now where hopefully we'll be able to be farmed soon. That would be a good documentary. Well, it's not me. <laughs> Any more questions? <clears throat> well, I would just like to thank you for a very interesting presentation. For sharing the history of Westfield and historic pits and colliery surrounding it, the development of the site and the redevelopment to produce a business park for clean energy production. Battery storage, food production, energy from waste facilities, combined heat and uh, power facilities, community liaison, the biodiversity, and the use of resources for the circular economy. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>